Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got a terrific guest with John Baisley from Baroness. Uh, super cool guy, very bright, extremely talented. Um, before we get into this, I just want to thank Monica Side Evanson for thinking about me and hooking us up. Thanks as always, Monica. All right, cliff notes on John. Founder, singer, primary songwriter, and rhythm guitarist of Baroness. If you aren't familiar with Baroness, you should definitely check them out. Their music is pretty intense, and they really rock out. It's kind of like hard rock, metal, some sludge, progressive, and alt alt alternative styles. Really good hard rock band, man. They're really, really good. Very engaging. Uh, and as my next comment, as a listener, this creates a lot of engagement. In fact, very different types of emotional engagement, depending upon what track you're listening to. Over the last 20 years, the band's released six albums, two live and one studio EP. Their latest album is called Stone. It's fantastic, and we're going to talk a little bit about it today. Baroness is about to head out on an extensive tour across the U.S., so make sure you check them out when they are near you. Uh, John is also a very prolific and legit, highly talented artist. As you can see, he's got his some of his artwork in, behind him in the studio. His artwork has graced the covers of all of the Baroness albums. Just check out the album covers, man. They're very specific, very unique. Uh, he's also created magazine and album covers as well as T-shirts for Revolver Magazine, Metallica, Flight of the Concords, and many others. And just a heads up to all of you existing fans, we are not going to talk about the bus accident in England. Uh, John's already talked a lot about this, and there's probably you know dozens and dozens of interviews online if you want to find out more. I'm sure he's ready to move on to discuss other things. That being said, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> You know, it's going to be the one of the better intros. Oh, cool. Really sweet of you. Oh, you're thank It's Monica. I love calling out the. She's great. Yeah, she's always, you know, she sends me a lot of like really cool people to talk with. So I appreciate that, you know? So, man, I found this really interesting. In 2017, you were asked to not only play at the Roadburn Festival, but also to curate all the artwork as well as curating the actual show itself and choosing all the bands. And I thought that was such a cool opportunity, and I had some questions about it. First of all, how did that even come about? Well, okay, so the, the, the Roadburn Festival is, is a festival that's it's been around, you know, much longer than the band. Maybe? Yeah, I think it's been around longer than the But they were, the, one of our, on one of our first European tours, we had a we had a show in Tilburg, Netherlands, which is where they hold the Roadburn Festival, at the venue 013, which is again where they hold the festival. And it was one of those shows for us in you know the history of our band where we just it was our first time ever in Netherlands, and the connection that we made that day is a is a connection that that we built that we built on every year following. So Netherlands always became like this sort of home away from home for us, and specifically in that's cool. We have quite a few friends. In fact, my good friend Yvonne, who I met that day, rolling into the, the first Dutch ship, she she actually became our tour manager for a short period of time when we were in Europe, and she was you know, she was on that ill fated bus crash day so you know we have a very i have a very close alliance with that country and that city and then uh, there's a, an, another art, another visual artist called Marlon Astrin who does many of who has on golden gray and purple done all of the interior illustrations for the group so it's it's kind of like a you know it's kind of when i say home i mean people i consider family there. and roadburn was a roadburn festival invited us um, i think it the at the end of our red album tour cycle at the very beginning of our blue tour cycle or blue record tour cycle and ever since that uh, that first road burn show that we played which would have been before probably 2009 um, I've, I've been very close and, and familiar with the organ the festival organizers and it was sort of this thing where like we would play it every year and it was always a great time, always a great place for us to go and see all of our like close friends, close touring friends from all around the world. And I became very active in the the community uh, that, that was Roadburn. And I think I had, I think we played it a few times and then I had shown, um, was their artist in residence one year. 
I don't know, a small gallery, sh- like retrospective gallery, sh- gallery show uh, around the block. And I think around that year, I was talking to the organ, the, the guy Walter, who, whose festival it is, and we just I, I sort of. I mean, I was sort of pitching the idea because I thought it would be cool that we could bring a two D visual or a visual art experience to the festival as well, because the festival was so based on the arts and creativity, and you know, sort of that forward thinking attitude that 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 worked. That, that that I've always had as well. It felt very synchronous with the way that we learn about things. So I think I sort of pitched the idea of bringing uh, like a poster art show that involved a lot of relevant visual artists from primarily from the you know sort of heavy underground music scene. Uh, and we were also at or I was also asked to curate the festival itself, which was a which is a huge huge honor for me. And because I think I think at the time I did it, I may have been one of the youngest, or if not the youngest, period uh, that did it. So I took I took the responsibility on as as a big one, and I for sure overloaded myself with far too much work and far too much organization for something like something like me who's disorganized by nature. And, <laughs> you know, being in charge of booking thirty some odd bands and you know curating this sort of art exhibition slash poster, you know, silkscreen poster exhibition. I had some, I had my screen printers from Minneapolis come out. Uh, we sort of branded that aspect of the festival as full bleed, which was just the, you know, the sort of 2D art side of it. I had some, you know, some, some of my contemporary artist friends uh, were there and they were doing like live screen printing. So it really was, it really, for, for me, was sort of the perfect thing because I've always considered this band a place for creativity, like, uh, to me, Baroness isn't just music, it's not just art, it's not just lyrics, it's not just live touring. It's so far has been nearly two decades of a, of a lifetime worth of, uh, of an art project that I'm, that I'm always finding uh, new avenues and, and new directions to, to move in. So for, for somebody like me, uh, curating a festival like that was validating in the sense that where I've put all my effort and all my time over the years has been in sort of debunking or demystifying, or at the very least providing an all, you know, in our, in, in the world of, I guess, hard rock or, or metal or, you know, you name it, just providing uh, an alternate to the idea that there's a huge difference between the performer and the audience. Um, making sure that, that our audience understands that I, don't consider what we're doing better or worse. I'm just, you know, the way I like to put it is like, I'm just generally like six feet taller than you and I've got a microphone. So I got, I got the loudest voice in right. the room. But that doesn't, it doesn't mean that, it just means I, maybe I lead the discussion occasionally, you know. Sure. Musician. But, but the real, you know, the real majesty of music, music, the real sort of transcendent beauty of it is that live music as opposed to recorded music differs in this one very fundamental way, which is that if, if we're a four piece and we're performing live, we need the fifth member, the fifth member being uh, the collective, you know, energy of the audience. And, you know, recognizing that uh, has given me the perspective and the philosophy that with, with this particular group, I don't, and I, I'll preface by saying I don't think this, apply, this would apply to everybody. I mean, for instance, when you see Guns N' Roses, you, you, you want to see larger than life. You want to see rock and roll at a level you can't attain. Right. But with Baroness, what I've always tried to prove, you know, both through through our output and, and, and the way that we address people and treat people, is that we're all capable, whatever I'm doing at any given point in time, we're all capable of. We're all capable of putting our own work into a creative endeavor and achieving some type of success and, and you know, potentially even d- defining success a little bit differently than, than, than is, than is average so that we can be creatively satisfied. But, but importantly, music doesn't come particularly easy to me. It's not, it wasn't, it, I'm not like a, a by far in a way, not a prodigy. I don't have the greatest voice. I don't have, I'm not the greatest guitar player. But I, but I, but I care your, deeply about what your I do. Your voice is pretty damn good. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Right, but my voice 
is something that I've had to learn. It's, it's something that I've had to accept as having positive qualities. You know, <laughs> it was a, that was a sort of a late in life life discovery for me. So, I've, I've always had this what I, I think probably amounts to like a type of false humility that I'm trying to shed myself of, which is this sort of self-deprecating, like, oh, I don't sing that well. I, don't. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't mean to say that in order to put myself down. I mean to say that because I just don't feel like I'm done learning. I don't feel, I still feel that I, I still have experiences on, you know, on the monthly, on the weekly that remind me that with enough investigation, with enough critical analysis and with enough opening up of the self, we can make improvements to, to, you know, to things like our voice and to things like our playing. You know, I think I heard something recently where, um, uh, what's his name? The, the ginger acoustic big songwriter guy, uh, Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> ginger. So, 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 Sheeran you know, was saying something like, and he put, I think he put an example of what he sounded like when he was a young musician out there. And it was, you know, it was not good. He he was saying, it's just work. You just have to put the, you just have to put the time and the effort in. You have to care about it, you know? And I think that's what, you know, if we have, if we have a message, it, it, you know, that it's, it's something along those lines, you know, we're not, we're, while we are socially conscious and socially aware and active, that's not what our band is about. While we're politically, you know, conscious, politically active, that's not what our band is about. Sure. What our band is about is trying to understand, harness, and use our creative boundaries to create something that is much, much bigger than any one of the four of us could potentially uh, create by ourselves you know to use every bit of our personal character every bit of our history every bit of you know our sort of open-minded approach to music to create music that frankly we just wish somebody else would write so we could hear it you know it's it's just that it's just i've always found the process is like deceptively simple on a concept on a conceptual level in that Oh, I should. I just need to make what I wish somebody else would make, so I could enjoy it. I need. That's to, interesting. I want to make what I want to hear. You know. Right. And I think that you know, because I, I think that that helps artists like me avoid becoming routine, becoming uh, lost in the refinement zone. Where, uh, whereas I think some people consider their career trajectories more more linear. Uh, you know, I start, I start at A and I want to end up at Z. So there's a linearity to it. And then it's just, it's just each record refines what you're good at. Each record tries to distill things that work well and, and improve on them. I think it's a very flawed philosophy. I think it's why a lot of veteran bands don't seem to have the, you know, the fire anymore or that seem to run a good song because I think they're not inventing. So for me, the, the, the idea is that well, that we're always in, inventing. And if, if we're, if we are fucking psyched and fired up about what we've done, that's the only thing that matters because we didn't, I promise you 90, 95% of musicians who start out didn't do that to, to make audience, make music to placate the audience. The vast majority of every creative person, artist, musician, whomever, starts out because you feel like something inside you is worth sharing. Yeah. And so it's the enthusiasm, the energy with which, you know, dedicated, ambitious artists share their music uh, that we respond to. I mean, the notes are, notes are limited. Western scales only got, you know, 12 notes. 12 notes, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the chord, pr tried and true chord progressions were tried and true in 1950. They haven't changed inexorably since then. Yes. Uh, so, so, I think I, I've come to think, I mean, this is, this is definitely like my mature perspective on things, but I've, I think in some ways I've always felt like this, that everything is a tool. The notes are tools, the chords are tools, my voice is a tool, the band is a tool, the, you know, feeling angry is a tool, feeling melancholic is a tool. They're all tools for self-expression and genuine self-expression. Uh, if you are trying to capture anything 
remotely as dimensional as the human experience. You need to use every fucking tool in your toolkit to do so. And the last thing that should ever hamper you are the limits of your creativity or what you perceive your audience wants to hear. Because those things will force you down and they will force you to do things that you think other people want when really the music that's impressed us all, the music that's inspired us all has come from that, I, I believe has come from that pure place where it's just trying to impress itself. And it's just trying, you know, the, the, that the self-awareness uh, can be a good thing when you realize that in a, in a, it, it, when you remove your false humility, when you realize that the thing that people have always appreciated about whoever you are and whatever it is that you're doing is that character that you bring to it is that idiosyncratic uniqueness uh so that's why you know with a record like stone for us we were we we had some very like clear um working concepts to prevent us from squaring things up or smoothing over too many rough edges because i think those edges that we, what we call edges what we call roughness what we call warts and bumps and bruises are in fact those elements of character that define us and they if we if we're careful and we're clever and we're pure about it we can use those rough edges to define ourselves because that's really what we have that no one else has oh my god dude thank you so what? much like best answer dude this is going to be a great conversation thank you so much that was so awesome dude that, oh my god that was real no i agree with you especially when you said um couple of things you said that stand out. I always try to like, if I'm stuck on something, one of the things I always try to do is, okay, what would I do if I was my friend and how would I advise them? Because it's that, you know, you, what you said, what would I want to hear? You know, when, you, when you're able to step outside yourself a little bit, it really helps move the ball along, you yeah. know? So it was really cool. And then um, you said something else uh, along the lines of, I don't, I I thought of this expression. I have you know, smart people realize how little they know, and it's you know, people that are maybe not so smart that think they know everything, and you know, it's that constant pursuit of you know, knowing that shit. There's a lot more to get out here. Let me let me open up and go after this shit, and just yeah, that was cool. In in the you know, in the case of this band, I think more often than not, the idea of opening up and absorbing new stuff is. It has, to, it has to happen without a whole lot of, with, with as little thought process as possible. Hey guys, this is a new project I'm involved with, so if it sounds interesting to you, give it a listen and let me know what you think. If you're a musician, composer, artist, or songwriter, and you're interested in an under-the-radar opportunity to make some serious money, even in today's uncertain music business, then check out this new free video training called Where the Money's Hiding in the Music Business in 2023. You can find it online at musicreboot.com, and this video shows you how to use your existing music and composing skills to create the financial stability you've always wanted. Because if you think, oh, I want to, you know, I want to open myself up to new experiences. I want to absorb a new sound or try a new, you know, try something new out. Then you start, then you're like, okay, well, in, in the infinitude of, <laughs> of color, sound, texture, technique, where do I begin? I, I say, doesn't matter. Do, you know, if, if, if you don't have the idea, reach for what's closest to you and make it work. And, you know, you'll, your instincts are your most important, you know, you know, the most important tool to refine. That's the only thing to refine is, is to make sure that you understand when your instinct is kicking in and saying, continue to do this or do not continue to do this. And then maybe briefly ask yourself why, just to make sure that it's an instinct and not like a fear. But, um, you know, I, I like to, I, I really appreciate and I really like that this current lineup that we have which is which we've had now for nearly 10 years everybody's been in the group long enough that they really understand about me and about my vision with this band that it relies on all, all the, the absolute you know participation complete submission of all four of us uh, you know as band members to sort of supplicate ourselves before this idea of what we are and and to act rather than four musicians, you know, in, in harmony to act as four servants 
lifting up the the greater i the broader idea that uh, you know of the music and of the band so that we don't we're not constantly looking at ourselves as like you know i don't see when gina's soloing i don't see that as like a solo moment for her i see that as a moment where the three of us have to create a bed for her light to shine as brightly as possible so in effect she's not shining the light on herself we're allowing that light inside her to shine bright i don't know that's a little it's a little overly romantic but no but it's, it's but it's a it's a process it's a way of approaching things and if that's your way great and i think one thing that that's become really interesting with this record that we've just done if i can just follow this tangent in the moment yeah is that we this is this this is quite literally the first record we've ever released with the state with a stable lineup so every record prior to this some there was somebody there was the presence of somebody new or the absence of somebody who had left uh, on you know on yellow and green for instance our bass player had just left the band so we recorded as a three-piece and i played bass but every other every other record that we've done has had somebody new coming in and when you know when there's a new musician in the band in bands, where so much of what we do is a, a chemical you know is a chemistry and, and bonds and, and reactions and like it's well we're always there's always somebody who's so new that the way we operate which i'm told is you know slightly unique by my bandmates i don't i, don't, I wouldn't know because i've never played in really another band but um there's always a learning curve for a new musician because my my greatest interest in in that situation is not that the three you know, the three veteran musicians do any particular thing, but rather that the the new the new musician under has an opportunity to learn what we are. And sometimes that take you know, as you can imagine, just uh, practically speaking, when somebody new joins the band, they don't want to screw up what's been done before. Sure. So so we're all very considerate. We're all very careful. And I've I've come to think you know that this record. What's really special about this record is that we that I for the first time have achieved a kind of solidity within the you know within the structure of membership in the band where everybody contributes music and everybody knows how to contribute music we're all so we all compose we all have you know we all share a similar drive for rehearsal and practice and work and we all have a, a similar uh, sort of creative ideal in, in that we sort of know we, we sort of know what works and what doesn't work. And that's, that's just a matter. It's just a, everything kind of happens and breaks now on the basis of trust and respect and intuition. So, you know, being able to, being able to essentially write a record that has no verbal theoretic conversation uh, is a, is a new thing for us where we can just react. And, um, you know, there's a handful of songs on the record that are fully improvised. There's a, the rest of them have at least you know a minute or two of un, a completely unscripted and completely untouched audio um, because we thought I don't know I just I think that was we were having rather than have these verbal conversations before we record before we would be in, in in the context of recording a song we would just jam and rehearse and learn each other's moves and feel the you know feel the sort of breath of the song where somebody's inhaling then i can exhale or uh you know if if gina for instance as as much as the other guitar player if she if her instrument is making a statement or asking a question then i'll sh i'm you know in a musical way kind of shutting up to allow that thought to uh permeate and then then i can respond so rather than everybody work on top of one another and at the same time it's 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 not that not that that doesn't work it's more that we have this ideal now that if we're if we're the better we know each other the more time we've spent on stage the more time we've played with it with, with each other and, and developed this chemistry the more we can allow that sort of bizarre alchemy of four people to create, you know, some new substance that none of us could control. Uh, and we certainly c couldn't achieve it if we tried to analyze it along the way, you know? Sure. So, it's, it's, so it's, you know, maybe, maybe like a bit of an old fashioned sort of, 
you know, I think you, I think you hear it in Zeppelin. I think you, you know, because they're 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 great at the jam. You know, yes. You hear it. You hear it a bit in the in the Stones. You hear it a bit in Floyd. And then I think each year successively after the you know the, after that sort of high point of seventies, uh, you know, experimentalism. I think it it becomes codified and a little bit more. Uh, standardized and you know the sort of as they call them the rough edges kind of get smoothed off as as music progresses from there until uh, until the 90s when you find like the grunge I mean I'm saying this because I'm a child of the 90s right so so for me grunge was like stood very firm against the you know the trappings of corporate record companies corporate record companies or or just bands that are writing songs about girls 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 or or whatever right so really my, that wasn't my thing so you know so i've i've built a band basically where our vision and our concept is so broad that you just apply it when necessary but but you know as you were saying um there's this sort of you know you know this sort of cooperative spirit um i think of it you know at the risk i'm just trying to wrap this up but i think of it maybe you know, analogous to like four people building a house, right? You need when you've got cr- when you've got crews who have worked together and know how ev- know the system and know how everything operates. And you know, if I'm an electrician and Gina's a plumber and Nick's a stonemason and Seb's a painter or whatever, then we can all go about our business knowing with with full respect and love for what the other people are doing, knowing that they're also helping create this house but there's a little bit of independence at the same time we just have to synchronize on you know certain aspects and then the structure becomes more important than the builders and the structure and the idea you know so the idea of the band becomes this thing that we're just trying to build up we're trying to we're trying to create stability when we need stability we're trying to create movement when we need movement texture when we need texture but we don't need to i don't need to i don't need ever need to say to my bandmates let's get atmospheric here <laughs> right as a, as, a, as a unique organism we feel that it needs to get got that yeah get so i think that's i think that's a you know it's something you've really got to you've really got to work hard to earn that and you've got to luck into having oh, yeah. those those covalent bonds with your bandmates um so i think i think the first like you know, 15 years of this group and it, and all it's like lineup changes were probably just me and the as you left just feeling like ah, it wasn't quite working. And then all of a sudden when it did, then, then we, you know, and we let it solidify and we just said, okay, you got to use this. This is, this is now the tool that we use to use. That's awesome. Thank you again. I have a question on one of the follow up. You said your instincts are your most important tools. So, have you always been like that? Because I believe that first, like right in my soul, but I, I didn't always, ha- wasn't always smart enough to recognize that. In less, in a less precise or articulate way, I did understand that when I was young, you know, m- my early musical experiences, I mean, I, I grew up in the I, in the first four final ups of this group, we grew up very, you know, in a very remote sort of rural location in Southwest right. Virginia. I mean, we based the band was started in Savannah, Georgia, but between between Rockbridge County, Virginia, where I'm from, and Savannah, Georgia, where the band, you know, defined who it was in their in the early ten years of history, we didn't have a whole lot of outside influence. You know, there wasn't there weren't national tours that would come through. There wasn't there wasn't a there weren't huge scenes that told you what to do. So whenever I would leave town, whenever I would come in contact with the music scene, I was always a little put off by it because it seemed that where I was initially drawn into punk rock and you know and metal and and the type of the types of music that I was, it seemed about it seemed like it was about being unique and being being about uh you know just having your own sound and then you go to these scenes and of course the scene sort of you know shrink wraps itself and tells you you know you're on the outside you can't come on the inside there's no osmosis here and this is you know there's a way you dress there's a way you look there's a way you behave 
da 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 da. And I was like, well, I didn't get into fucking music to do this. Was like, yeah, this yeah. Actually, the exact reason why I got into music was to avoid this because it seemed like a creative place where I could, you know, for warts and all, just like be myself. And I think that was my the you know the first sense of instinct that I had was like, well, something something sort of feels fishy about identifying with a genre something feels fishy about doing you know about every literally every time that anybody in the in the business uh has ever told me well that's just the way it is i go well i reject that i mean like right isn't that, isn't, isn't the job of the artist to to reject the you know the status quo and to question the way things are i mean it, it, at the very least i'd like to prove that that's i'd like to prove that this you know, this horrible thing you're telling me I have to do is is the only way to do it. But I'm going to do my damnedest to work around that and do something yeah. which feels like it falls more in line with my own ideals and ethics and morals as a, as a, as a musician. So then, you know, as that pertains to music itself, I think that's a trickier thing because when I'm, when you're a young musician, you're, you really just, op I, I feel like I did at least, I really just operated inside the, ideas that i'd heard other people have because i the, back then all throughout our history and to this day and as far as i can see into the future it's beg borrow and steal in terms of musical ideas because yes. as, we, as we've already established there's only so many notes to, right it's, del it's deliciously few so if you hear so for me it's like when you hear something and better that it's far outside your genre better that it's far outside your lane and you absorb that and you try to figure out a way to make that piece of music that you're stealing yours because you better believe that the person who wrote it also stole it. absolutely and, and i and i say steal just to just to just to reiterate just take it just take the idea if you, if you're you know and this is where instinct comes in into play you'll know you'll know when you've owned it, you'll know when it's become part of your DNA. Uh, but that's the, you know, that again is one of these really sort of mystifying, difficult to, you know, sort of wrap your head around concepts, which is that when the first time we hear a melody, that melody becomes ours. That's what, that's why people say music is a gift because the musician, the artist gives you this music for, it's for you. Yeah. And, and what you do with it is, is up to you. And as a musician, when I hear something that's, when I hear something powerful, I wonder, well, why is this affecting me this way? But by the time I'm wondering that it's already something that's already rubbed off on me. And then I feel fully licensed to use it. Um, but it's, you know, it's my job. My job is effectively to use my creativity so that it doesn't sound like sure. Peyton's ninth or uh, you know what or yeah. you know Welcome to the Jungle or whatever right. you know. Sure, like sure, I, sure. I take that. I take that as a fun challenge. You know, I mean, it's 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 you know it's it's why painters paint. I mean, we've got cameras. If you want if you want the literal narrative picture, if you want the if you want the thing that's very close to reality, take a photo. If you right. want that thing that allows you, and, and not, not to shit on fine art photography, but just to say that this we've all got we've all got a wonderful piece of equipment in our hands that can document anything that we see. Right. But in order to in order for us to see it in a new way, sometimes we have to mimic that form and render that form musically or lyrically or uh, visually. And we'll find that it is actually something else. There's some, there's like a hidden energy. And I think music is, I don't mean this in a hippie way. I mean this like almost as scientifically as possible. Music is energy. It is yeah, yeah. absolutely energy. It's just 100%. In a, in a very complex, very subtle, very sophisticated, very impossible to in, disentangle from, you know, from, from reality sort of way. And yeah, so understanding how to trust your own gut is at the point where you're you know at the point where you've already certainly at the point where you've already established yourself as a, as a musician your instinct tells you one thing does it sound like me or am i not there yet and that's that's sort of that like and, and even sometimes and you know i like we'd like to do this in the studio but it's like you know musicians we, we all get wrapped up about oh i'm not playing it right i'm not doing this with the right 
right the, the right way. I'm not sure about that. And my question is always, does it sound cool? Well, yeah, okay, then it's cool. Move on. Like, right, right. Like, there, there's, there is a value to, there's a value to thinking it's cool rather than knowing that the Mixolydian scale has been represented accurately. You right. Know? You know what? It always cracks me up. You mentioned Zeppelin before, and I read these interviews or I see these geniuses talking on wherever on online. You know, oh, Jimmy Page was sloppy. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's sloppy. Whatever. Okay. I, I never had a problem. I never had a problem. Sloppy. Yeah, right. Any half as sloppy as a tenth as sloppy as that. Yeah, I know. It, but it's talking about what you. It's it's in reference to what you said. It's like you you don't have to go in the studio and buff out a note. Like why would that sounded perfect what he did? I mean, but, it, but here's the thing: it's like Stairway to Heaven lead versus Cliffs of Dover. It's like yeah, the Stairway <laughs> to Heaven lead is it's it's music. It's a it's a it's a vocal part. You know, then like it being simple and you being able to hear the pick and like the the ebb and flow on the, the you know feeling, the, but the, it's the feeling. Feeling isn't quarter notes specifically on downbeat. Correct. Feeling, feeling is how far behind it is it? Right. Energy is how far ahead of it is it? Um, and, and you know, then there's dynamics, then there's pressure, then there's tone, then there's there's all sorts. It's like I said, it's it's science, but it's it's like quantum physics science. Like, yeah, there's still a whole lot. There's a whole lot of unknowns because I'm just describing a guitar, and then there's drums, and there's bass, and there's then there's the the air in the room that, yes. that's important to it. And I think like yes, there's you know. Why didn't the Parsons Project take off like Zeppelin or Floyd did? <laughs> because not not because the music's no good, because it's great. I you know yeah. I love it, but it's it's smooth. It's like you know you know what you know what uh, Plant's voice has is like he's got he puts grit on it. That's yeah. That's that's the, that's anti technique. You know, if you look at classicists, if you're li listening to opera, you you can't you can't growl in opera. You can't. Yelp, you can't let your voice do all those natural things. You have to control it. Uh, you know, and rock and roll is, is I mean, am, am I crazy? Rock and roll is, is like, is breaking all of those rules simultaneously. Singing no, you're not notes. crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> so, so, so it, you know, I think it takes a very long time to get to the point where you recognize that the things Oftentimes, the things that we hear when we when we as musicians hear playback of our performances, we're often cringing because something there we have this we have this thought in our mind that it's different than than it is, or um, that we could have done it better, smoother, more accurately, more clinically correct. But the audience doesn't care. the audience doesn't care. No, you know, maybe maybe the guy who's like, you know, Paige is too sloppy, but I'm like, what? Show me where. Yeah, like, right, right. Show me where it's too sloppy. Like, right. I've never like, listened to a Led Zeppelin record and said, "Oh, this guitar playing isn't really up yeah, to snuff today." <laughs> yeah, like maybe the maybe a better word is loose. Maybe a better word is loose. Yeah. That's just, right. That there's no negative connotation there. It's yeah. It's, He's loose. I mean, you watch. There's like that one. Uh, there's this footage I watch it all the time because it's it's hilariously amazing. Where he's like, um, he just like sitting down with the like the silver tone guitar or the Dan Electro or whatever it was, the real one. And he just it, like the band's band's like taking a break, and he just is playing like he's just making up a kind of solo lead thing. It's really fast picking. It's complete theoretic garbage. It's just Page being Page, moving fast and playing things like generally in in a key. But that's not the important. The the thing is, it's 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 tremendous to watch it. Right. You know what is what all, is that clip? What is he? Where, where is that? What is that clip called? Oh, if I wanted to look that up, maybe it's maybe it's where he's doing one of those. He's like electrically doing one of those. Um, like English or Welsh, like like fingers. a Celtic song or something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. Like one of those Burt Janch or John Renburn things that he does. Sure. 
but it, but he turns it into this like distorted electrified thing through a, I mean, the guitar kind of sounds like the strings are like painful to play. Like, you, you know, that, that like tight, loud, sharp piercing kind of thing. And he's just shredding. And the, my bandmates like to say, I, I, I operate in free time pretty, pretty frequently, but it's like, <laughs> you know, he's, he's very much in free time. There's no, yeah. there's a, a, for, for any like bar of what he's doing, he's got a rhythm, but it's likely to change and become intensely variable from, from moment to moment. I, I just think that we, we, we cannot lose collective appreciation for that level of play. And I think that I, I really, I'm not, I'm not going to do too much of the old man thing, but like, I do think that Instagram has made too many gospel chopper shredders with too, too sophisticated, too smooth, too sweet, too fast, yeah. too technical. I think that technique is a tool as a, as a, a in my opinion, take your technique and in, introduce a new tool. And that new tool is looseness, you know, like try that, try what happens. Try your technique with looseness. Try your, you know, that's, I think that's what, I think that's what Stevie Ray Vaughan did. Oh, hell you yeah. Know, he had an incredible technique, but he, it just feels wild, you know, like Hend Hendrix, I mean, is just like fully wild. It's, right. It's full on magic. And you see people talk about Hendrix all the time too. And they're like, oh yeah, he's, you know, he wasn't like the greatest blues player. It's like, well, what? I don't like him because he's, <laughs> don't like he's the greatest blues player. I like him because he's the greatest guitar player. Yeah, you know? right, right. Like Blues is blues was like the springboard and the you know the multicolored universe that he skyrocketed into. That was that was his home. You know? That was amazing. And you know, I agree with you hundred percent as far as all the, the shredding thing on online because it's like that's nice, but I would never hum that. I I had to, I can't hum that. Yeah. You know? I can't drive in the you know, if I'm having a bad day, I can't so that's not going to soothe me, you know. No, so I, I'm with option. you on that. Yeah. It's just like it's like it's like watching fireworks. It's like it's yeah. awesome to watch it. It's awesome to watch it, but right. you're not. There's nothing to think about when you leave. Once it's done, right? It's like right. Okay, they did. They did the red one, the green one, the boomy ones, <laughs> the ones with the little sparkles, and I was totally enthralled, and I was totally mystified by that moment of explosion of, of explosion that by that, you know, by those chemical bonds breaking that, that was what was impressive to me, but I'm not right. wondering what, what, what's behind it all, you know, right, right. now let's get ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, so, you know, I think, I think it, it, it's like begun to, to I've begun to think of things and in, in, begun to categorize music in terms of, is it musical or is it technical? You know, is it, Agreed. is it true? Is it true art or is it, is it just really well-made craftsmanship? And right. I'm not interested in craftsmanship. I'm interested in magic. You know, music, music is the, the real beauty of it is that it's something we have no concept how to replicate. We don't, we don't know how to replicate the same instance twice. You can show me something that you can do, and it's magical when you do it. And when I do it, it sounds horrible and embarrassing. So that's that's because something's you know there's some there's some aspect of us. It's I think some of it's like ergonomics. Some of it's just like well, here's my wrist doesn't really do right. it doesn't move like my wrist moves a certain way. My fingers, my vocal cords, acting on impulse, want to do certain things, and those are those are not intrinsically, but fundamentally me. Yes. And don't my, my great advice to every gospel chopper out there is like harness with harness, the thing that makes you different, not the thing that makes you faster, better, or, or the same as everybody else, but harness that thing you figure out what it is that makes you different and push that, push that until it's absolute extreme. Thanks again, man. Good stuff. So let me, I want to talk about some of my favorite Baroness tracks. Like we don't have time to cover all of them. And it was tough for me to choose, but um, here goes. So my favorite album is Yellow and Green. So I want to start with the line between. I I really love the melody of that song and the message and the lyrics as far as my interpretation, as far as taking things for granted because tomorrow you might be gone and sort of like walking the line between the righteous and the, the wicked. 
Uh, I really love that track. What, what's the backstory to that? I mean, the backstory to all of our songs is fairly similar because I have really enjoyed, and this might sound like a common answer on this, but what I, what I do with our records lyrically is I just write about the most you know immediate experiences like whatever you know it's like a, the feeling of the day or reflection on something i've gone through or or you know it's just they're just moment to me everything is just a momentary peak in time and the records are for me the records are important because i i just hear what that period of my life was like you know i hear what i was going through and so i can't i can't there's a handful of examples where i can say yes this song is like narrative perspective about this one particular thing sure and the more i can do that the less i will in, you know publicly because i think it ruins the listener's experience i get you but, but, but i think you kind of, i think you kind of nailed it like i think i think another thing that is sort of deceptively simple about music is there's only so many subject right we, we, we yeah, it's not a science manual yes so we've got heartache, we've got sorrow, we've got loss, we've got mortality, we've got love, we've got, I don't know, I'm running out. Guilt. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Guilt. But, right. but like, by and large, they're the sort of negatives in life, they're the, the sort of darknesses in life. And that's why I, I do, I say, I say music is sort of like alchemy because you're taking raw materials raw identifiable materials that are that don't have very much value and you're trying to turn them into gold you know you're trying to take darkness and transmute it through a musical process into light and yeah that's a, that is a tremendous that is a tremendous power that that music has is that it and so much and it does it much more easily than than other media you know like because I think it moves by at the at the rate you're absorbing it, uh, and it's co it's it's constantly giving you something. It's it really is it really has this beautiful way of almost the more painful the experience that it draws upon, the more sincerity that you have to and respect you have to use with that subject matter, and the and the brighter its transmuted material can can become. So yeah, I mean quite literally it was you know. It was sort of a song that just where I, it's like not a, an uncommon theme for me, but it's, it's one of these songs where I'm trying to reckon with, you know, the parts of me that I think that I assume other people would see as like positives, but also recognizing that, that, you know, sometimes I'm intensely wicked. Sometimes I, sometimes I'm intensely unhealthy or, or, you know, sometimes in the, in the, in the pursuit of adventure, I'll go to a length that isn't, great and uh, you know and on top of that that pursuit of both righteousness and my willingness to admit my wickedness is part of what it is like to be human you know like, right yeah, you can't you can't steady you can't you can't find true north if you don't understand the breadth and scope of everything around you and i and i i I think a, a lot of times my lyrics sort of get there, but I, I, I really like that song. I thought, you know, when we recorded, I was like, I thought to myself, this song might toe the line a little bit. It, it, it's like a little, at the time for me, it was a little more direct lyrically than mo much of what I was writing. And I think that the, the like the tenor of the song was like unfamiliar in, in that it sounded like something, it sounded like, it, a song that if it, it sounded like a song like if Pearl Jam covered it, it would be a, make a, like a like a note a notable song or something or like it's like if if like any competent any competent rock band could play that song, <laughs> it would still be the song would still hold up. Like yeah. it didn't feel like it was particularly like well, this is just how we do it. This is our way to do it. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, that was a little uncomfortable for me at first, and I think in what way? I, I don't think we. I, I don't know. I don't know. I I really like the. I really like the stamp of strangeness, and I think that song didn't have very much of it. I I read uh, that, but, 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 I, but I but I but I but I like that song, and I think it's a shame that we haven't. We it's really not a live staple for us. Uh, after after the lineup that recorded it, recorded it, that we 
I don't think we've ever played it on stage. Well, dude, you're coming to Tampa sometime, so I'll be in the audience. So play it. <laughs> I love, I love the, I love the arrangement of that song. I think, I think the, it's a great the, song. The, the way that the way the, the guitar part in the verse uh, has this thing that that I love about it, which is I'm playing. There's, there's, I'm, I, I like to, I love to use my, the open B and E string on my guitar. I love it more when it's when the notes very much don't work in in the context of the song. You know, where there's dissonance. So, so like, yeah, when there's dissonance. So I'm playing like a C sharp minor. Okay. Um, I mean, we tuned down to D, so you have to you have to like move this down to two notes. But right. we're playing the, the songs in E major, and I'm playing a C sharp minor and letting the B and E fly through it, and they're very they're like very jarring notes otherwise but because it's just in this arpeggio all i'm doing is moving a shape around i love that i love something we do a lot is we take shape i'll take a like a chord shape right and i'll just move it wherever i want to move it and let whatever incidental notes that are open happen and they don't care what the shape is they're trying to fight against it and sometimes it just has the cool effect of like making the the harmonic structure of the song feel good and then feel bad and then feel good again and it's just sort of at random so it i i like that 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 i really like about that song you know it was, it, yeah, was a, it was a fun one to write i know that alan who was our drummer at the time that song had the, the distinction on, on of all of the tracks on yellow and green as being the only one we wrote in 10 minutes oh it's a great that's a, well you know what i've heard so many stories of guests i've had on the show of of like that's not uncommon where they write like a top hit or like just a really nice song really quickly like that yeah yeah uh, yeah it's interesting but you know i read that up you know i read a lot of your interviews in preparation for this and you know i you 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 say that a lot that you like to be sort of um you said, I think you said the word strange um well it's what, i don't i mean, let me redefine there is a there's a thing that feels normal and natural to me that i think other people decipher as strange uh it's just easier for me to say not, strange not your than, problem <laughs> yeah, it's not, but it's not but it's not my it's not my problem so that when i when i write a song that doesn't have that quality to it it sort of nags at me but not for any good reason just just in that like i've got to you know i gotta live with everything that i've ever done for the rest of time because unfortunately <laughs> I've chosen to record it and document yeah. it and right, share it. Right. So when I don't do something, when I do something that I always felt a little odd about, like it's always, it's always pretty close to the surface, but I do like that song. You know, I think That's it's a great, it's, I, think it's a good song. I think it's sincere and there's a simplicity to it that mm -hmm. especially on yellow and green worked particularly well. And yeah, it just, it's a cool song. I hope we play it again at some point. Yeah, man, I do too. Uh, the closing track, which is kind of like the uh, the coda for the line between, and it's a beautiful instrumental that closes that awesome record called "If I Forget the Low Country." Even the name is like it's like very majestic, sort of, you know. And uh, it's it's a beautiful song and sad. This is like what we were just talking about a minute ago. But yet it's very uplifting at the same time. And I thought it was a great example of how something simple can really make you feel something powerful. So again, tell me about that track. And also, if you remember, besides Echo, what effects did you have on the guitar? Because it was just like shimmering, like really beautifully, man. It was, a tough, it was a tough. It's tough to remember exactly because I'm a oh, big, time, I'm a big time effects guy. And on, and in addition to that, I'm very much, I very much don't keep tabs on what I do. I just move right through it. Like it's, it is this. It's an arm's length. I'm using it. <laughs> no, why it's going to work or if it's going to work, I just plug it in. If it sounds cool, that's what it is. But yeah, I'm pretty sure. I but however. I'm pretty sure that was the Maxon delay, the big one, the big pink one. It was like the 999 had a pretty decent uh, amount of delay on it. Um, and I've always been like a big, I think it's obvious now, but a big part of my m musical inspiration, a big part of my like internal, maybe not, 
and not as like external sort of uh, inspiration and, and motivation it comes from uh, like a particularly sort of sad type of like country music or folk or Americana, uh, you know, like artists like Gillian Welch, Dave Rawlings and, um, you know, Redheaded Stranger by Willie Nelson. Like, I love I love the Ennio Morricone scores of great. Oh, that, dude, so that, that guy's so amazing. I, yeah, so so yeah. I was I was sort of at the time I was just like I think trying to write something that had a bit of that l lonesome. Yeah, that's voice. a good word for that lonesome. Yeah, yeah, and it it, so it kind of has like a almost like a high plains kind of lilt to it, little swagger, yep. like like I can. It's got a it's got a very particular like environmental setting in my head and and it just yeah that was it is very fun when when we come up with something that isn't terribly like complicated you know that's yeah, just, it was... that's the thing you can play it over and over again and um yeah I mean it's it's a pretty it's a pretty and it's a pretty simple line I I I, I love I love the I love the sort of bittersweet, melancholic, lonely, sort of down aspects of that you can find, particularly on guitars when you're playing a song in E major. I find that the open E major chord, while it us it's, it's a big, very bold, very majestic, very full sounding chord, when you find the minor aspects surrounding that chord, or when I do, uh, I'm always really happy because I think it's, it's like, it's a little, it's very sweet. I think E major, the shape on a guitar, the way it resonates and everything in, in that key, it feels very sweet to me, but there is a, there is always a little bit of a sadness to it. You know, like I think the Allman brothers do really nice. They do major. E major thing. Right. But, but, but really well, there's just a touch of sad in it. You know, there's a touch of, you know, there's a feeling that I get out of the shape of E major on a guitar, because when we play E major, generally speaking, it's going to be D major. Right, um, right. So I'm not talking about the pitch as much as the way that the strings Just sort the of shape of the, the, the chord. Yeah, the, shape, yeah. The, shape, the shapes you can make and use the low E string. Because that's what it is. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, it's just like... But it was just, yeah, like, oh, there's tr tremolo probably. Probably yeah. Really okay. Right. There is. I think, I think it's a. I think it's a. A pretty vintage guitar through like a AC thirty or something. So it's got that kind of stiff, weird Morcone kind of thing going on. Yeah. Beautiful. Really pretty song. From Golden Gray, two thousand nineteen. Let's talk about Cold Blooded Angels. Oh, I yeah. actually thought that was Gina singing with you. And I was like, God, these guys sound amazing together. Then like it was, I, I don't ever oh, do it this. Is, it is Gina. Oh, it is. I thought it was cause I don't know. She's one of them. Okay. Cause I, I never like look up songs when I'm prepping for these. I, you know what? Let me just look this up. And I, 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 I was shocked to read that it was your daughter. Yeah. My daughter uh, was nine. It said at the time. Yeah. That's I mean, crazy, man. I, caught, I just caught her in a really good moment where she she wanted to sing she thought it was cool and she she didn't realize how out there that that would make her or whatever um and, what a great yeah, bonding she, moment for I, that must yeah. have been so cool doing that with your daughter Dude, i wish it was such a powerful moment you know to be tracking my daughter singing yeah. the song that i i i didn't want to take my eyes off it even to take a photo or like catalog it i just had to i just had to like live in the moment but yeah that was yeah that was cool. gina sings gina sings the the majority of the, the okay it, the, um, the vocals are the two of you guys together just in, you and gina in general re, huge very cool difference it's very yeah. awesome man yeah that song i mean when was she and i she and i wrote that song and it, it was it was work because it's so it's such a complicated song. It's so very complicated. Like changes the, or the changes and the the arrangement uh, of the arrangements. Of no, I mean, the, the the beginning chord progression is it's not like 
I don't think it's I don't think it's all that strange, but it's it's got a lot of complex chords in it, uh, and it's all picked in a way that's very particular. But the way that she and I harmonize both our vocals and our guitars in that tune it's 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 like it's what what we love doing what i've always loved doing in baroness is splitting the harmonic duty between two guitars i mean I, and i typically write for three guitars so a lot of times you'll you'll hear i don't think in that one you hear a third guitar but i think about it in terms of three guitars That's interesting. Sometimes, sometimes the third guitar is the basic one that does everything and okay. i just imagine it being gone so that the other two can actually exist i might, I might okay. never even hurt. i might never even attempt the third guitar but i need the foundation for it because a lot of times what we'll do is we play i guess they're like 11 chords 11th or 10th or something but we split we split we will and this song's a great example of it. a lot of times we'll only be each of us will only be playing a chord with two notes in it oh uh, okay the root See note is very infrequently used as the dominant note or the lowest note and nine times out of ten we're predominantly playing harmonic notes to the to the root but in a strange order you know what i mean like i'll play i'll like play, you'll play a first and a seventh and she'll play a third and a fifth or something like that yes but interesting but 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 the dip the, the you know in the, in the in a good portion of that song and many songs that we do it, I'll like I'll, oh, I don't have a guitar nearby, but like, I'll like there'll always be two or three strings separating the two notes that we are playing. Even if oh. it's power, I'll play a power chord that's got it's that's got one note on the E or A string and another note on the B or E string, and that's okay. the power chord. And then she'll play harmonic notes to that also split, but that by that difference. So it sounds like we're pay, playing a broader chord than we are. Because the notes aren't the notes aren't as chunky and clustered as as they would be if you were playing a bar chord or a power chord. Sure. So I so I have this way of like instead of playing the power chord root fifth, I'll play fifth root, and then we'll use some string. It's just it's kind of like shape shifting. You just I just find these like one thing that that we started doing with Golden Gray and it was really prevalent on Stone at least from my guitar input is I try to take I try to take the idea of the shape and and move it only as far as I need to down or upwards. So I'll try to play all the chords anywhere on the no, and, and on the neck so that there's a descending scale or an ascending scale. Wow! So uh, you're putting tons of effort into arrangements here. Holy oh, shit! For, for sure, we put so oh much work into them. It's it it defies common sense for sure. And and but yeah, I, I that's why it sounds studio. so good. I have right? a. I, I have a saying in the studio where, or there was one time we were listening, we were doing playback on something on Golden Grand, and it may have been Cold Blooded Angels. Like, and somebody said, Who else could ever write this song? And <laughs> I think it was, I think Seb's response was, Who would want to? Like, why would, why would anyone write this music? Like, it's, it's not. There'd be no point for anyone else to, to go about doing things the way that we do. And they're just like, this is just the way we do it, you know? So our arrangements are actually really, really complex at times. Uh, they come from a natural place. That's just the natural way that I yeah, yeah. compose. It does, it doesn't, it's not, it's not always pleasing to me to hear the, the most straightforward version of something played. So I've, uh, most of the songs when, as I write them kind of start off in this like complexity level. And then very frequently I'll I'll just try to like distill it down to play it acoustically or something. I'm like, oh, it's it's a three chord song. I just didn't okay. know, you know, or um, you know, lots lots of like uh, minor seventh chords uh, that we just build we just build them in really really strange sorts of ways. And yeah, it's it's really love the way. And I've, this is something I've like discovered recently. But it makes a lot of sense to me, even as dizzying as it is to listen to. But the 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 way that Beethoven piano sonatas are organized, with a very distinct, with very distinct melodic movements in in a bit in the bassier realm of the of the piano, and then another distinct sort of complement to that 
that's a little bit higher up. I really like I really like how things can seem to move apart and come together with great with a great amount of like breadth and width. But it's really just it's kind of just like a simple it's a simple idea stretched into a complicated you know form or shape, and that, that's something that has always been of interest to me primarily because it's how I write and I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to sometimes figure out what it is that I've written. Uh, if so that I can explain it to somebody. Well, now too, I'm understanding why even more the value of having this consistency with, with you and Gina now, because yeah. you lock into something like that. You're the, the new person. Oh my, the, you know, that's a big thing to start from scratch at to try to like, and that was yeah. the first, the, the day that I met her and we, she was, she's, she wasn't consciously trying after the band. We were, yeah, I, we were I read just, this. We were just getting, getting together to jam. And I, I saw that she played a lot of those shapes that I played that I don't see other people playing like this, you know? Okay. It's a, it's a I think it's just because it, it, it's like, it's less efficient seeming to other people. But for me, it's the most, it's like these really spaced out two note chords are like really come really naturally to me. And I can play it's 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 like I think now now that I've like had years to analyze it I think what I I think what comes easily to me is the idea of a bar chord and how many how many open chord shapes I can fit over that bar chord if I was to you know so it's fret the fifth fret I can play the I can play I can impose a C form I can impose a G form I can impose most of a D I can impose an A minor and E minor. You know, you can do all these. You can, you can put those shapes anywhere you bar. Sure. So just remove the bar, remove all the notes except the one that makes sense to me. But when you know, when you've got one note locked, you know, if I've got like a, I've got an A locked, then three strings over, I can move my pinky and I can create power chords, major thirds, minor thirds. And and I can invert it and, and I can invert it and create this this as the root and this as the the harmonic note. It's just there's just a it's just a weird thing or it's just kind of a unique thing I think to me where I like to see I like to see how much you can imply with two notes without having to fill it all out. And this... then I like to marry that against the second guitar that then can really flesh it out and you can create some really unique sounding. Uh, like chords which aren't really special chords they're just played in in a sort of a unique way that feels great when it's done together super nerd question so when you're playing these two notes are you just playing them with two fingers or are you playing them are, are you muting the strings in the middle of that with your with your left hand yeah i know very nerdy question it depends, sorry it depends like i when i was when we were recording red uh, we had just come off a tour in, in Europe or in England and the band that we were touring with turned me on to uh, the guitar player, John Fahey. Oh yeah. And the English. Yeah. Acoustic player. Yeah. Really soulful guy. American acoustic player. But oh, he's he played, I didn't, okay. he played sort of in the tradition of like the much more like technically astute uh, English and Welsh guitar players. But his thing was sort of like, like he was sort of like a American folk traditionalist and, and historian. Uh, but he, like, I liked, I especially liked him because his playing had feeling in a style, you know, in finger style guitar, which doesn't always have a tremendous amount of like soul and feeling to it. Thank you. Uh, I, I, <laughs> no, because I'm like, people are like, oh, this guy's a great finger style player. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not going to hum that. <laughs> and I yeah. and it can't, you know, you don't want to like judge. It just shatters someone's, you know, because obviously to this person it's like amazing. But I understand yeah. what you're saying. You know, like, well, yeah, I mean, just it's just a more delicate way of playing a chord. Like, it's right. still gotta be, it's still gotta be musical. You know what I mean? So I kind of I appreciated that that in his playing, and I just ever since then I I have I play about it feels like sometimes about half of my half of the set we play. Like Gene and I don't necessarily always use picks. A lot of times, oh, okay. We just, and but but because we're electric guitar players, we got to tuck our pick in between our uh, in whatever this finger is, the third finger. Yeah. So I'll just tuck it up there, and then I've got at the very least I've got three fingers that I can pluck with. It's okay. Sort of, sort of tough to pluck with your pinky too much when you're anchoring your pick with your third yeah. finger. But, but um, 
other than that, the, the thing that I really like about this this sort of chord voicing is that you can your fingers naturally mute the center notes. Yes. And so you can strum it, and you get that percussive. You get that percussive, like str string strafing sound. But you get the two notes that pop out, and it's really cool. It's different. It's much different than if you pluck. It's much different if you pluck them. Yes. Um, you know, and so it's. I think it's this like sort of mute and strum the thing that actually makes it sound really unique to me because there's there's like you know there is the attack of that like percussion, like the sort of tambourine effect of it. Uh, but the, but there's also you know a distinct chord that's making itself known so if you listen to a song like um i wish i had a guitar because i could show you more easily hold on let me see if i got one yeah man do just, your take thing. A, just, just take a second i don't awesome. think i do have a good one up here no, no. just because no one ever asked me about music like like music stuff so I, I know that was a super nerd question, but I'm, I've only been playing guitar like five or six years. So if I, I, I found that way interesting what you said. So I said, let me, what, what can I, I wanted to learn something out of that. To so be honest like, with you. We have a song, it's, it's a pretty much a live stable horse called, horse called Golgotha. And it, the first chord is, okay. Okay. Bye -bye. Okay. Okay, so the compliment to that is. Now you go and do that descending thing you talked about. Yeah, man. Okay, so, well, that was the last chord wasn't great, but um, the idea. I mean, no, it was thing, great. Rough the edges. Is, the whole thing's based on a shape. The shape was. Which is, it's garbage. That's not, that's not music. But I found these chords created a much more complicated arrangement of chords than it looks because this is just going up. Okay, so that sort of has this like, it, it kind of feels like classical music, you know? Yeah. So that's minor, minor, major. But you can also turn this D, in, with, or this is like an E minor with a, like the A minor form on there. Sure. But I can also turn it into a D like a D form or a C form or a G and all of those things, all of those things I just have had to learn over 10. Yeah. Cause I'm a self basically a self-taught player. I just had to learn that those are all like much more natural sounding chords than I actually think they are. But because so much of the perspective reference is, is removed and not played, you're left with a, you're left with a place that invites a little more, it invites melody in or harmony in, in, a, in a different way and allows a little bit more spaciousness for it. Because I'm not playing six chords and Gina's, or I'm not playing six notes, Gina's not playing six notes. So it's, it's effectively like giving us a little bit more breathing room to play with our, play vocally or, or allow the bass to create a melody uh, because we're not, we're not cutting off all those avenues of harmonics uh, quite as, strictly it's good that you gave yourself permission to do that because so many times you know as a musician you know you're like well you're not supposed to do that and it's good that you said you didn't you just said fuck it this is i like this so i'm gonna do it yeah i mean almost to the point where i i, I just wanted things that you weren't supposed to do and i just wanted yeah. to see if i could find something cool with them and so so many of my sort of natural uh movements some many of my natural things are just based on those early years the formative years of my playing where i was just trying to do something that sounded different than everybody else right uh and in doing so i realized how it wasn't it wasn't different it just had a different feel you know right. slightly different feel, but there was nothing particularly exciting when you dig in and go well what's the what's the underlying structure the underlying right. structure is solid and normal and you can make music out of it. you can write a song on top of it uh because it's not it's not dissonant or anything um yeah and it's just i i don't know i think that that type of playing has always been interesting to me uh and it's but it's something that that you know when when we every time we've had to get a new guitar player i've had to sort of show that 
Yeah, that's... Not, it's not an obvious thing. They're like, oh, I thought it was this, this, this. I'm like, it is, it is that, but we we arrange it a little differently. You know, we structure, we we voice it in a in a more exciting way. I think. Very cool, man. It was I've never heard of that or seen it. All right, so I want to talk about a few tracks off the new album, Stone. Again, fantastic album. Let's start with Choir. Love Gina's guitar in the opening and. Man, I'm not blowing smoke, but your voice on that song was just phenomenal. It really reminded me of sort of like old school punk, you know? Yeah. And I was curious, was your voice doubled or was there an echo on that? Uh, if you remember. So, so first off, those, that song is an improvisation. The whole thing is an improvisation. Awesome. Wow. We, we had the idea because I wanted to do a trilogy, which is Beneath the Rose, choir and then finishes with the dirge um so choir is choir the only thing the only discussion we had about it was it's it's the it starts on the it starts on the final beat of the prior song it stays at that tempo and it stays in that key uh and other than that we rec- I think we, I believe we recorded three versions of it, all improvs. One was five, one was eight, one was like 15 minutes. There was no, there were, there were no, we were not trying to go anywhere with it. We were just trying to see where it took us, you know? Wow. And what you hear musically, instrumentally is the first take. We did. That's cool. It just, it just had. Every time, every time something happens, and every like little mo- musical moment in that song is completely unscripted, and I think because of that, it's got a really cool kind of depth to it. There's a couple parts where like where Gina and I are like playing chords, but because because Nick is just riding a single note the entire time. Yeah, when we played chords, we had we we were so, we were playing chords vaguely in the key of the song. She and I didn't even know we were going to play the chords at the time we did, and they certainly aren't the same chords. They're not complementary, so it's like a it's got a really weird kind of tone to it because because they're not there's no rationale applied whatsoever as to why we're playing what we're playing. It's just happening. We're just sort of you know she sort of felt it coming on. I could I think I sort of felt across the room that she was going to do that. And I looked at her and she, I could see that she was winding up for something. So I just put my fingers wherever they went initially. We hit the first chord. Then I, then I tried to pick up on when she was going to, I could tell she wanted to do like a a thing, but (laughs) excuse me. When I listened to isolated playback of the guitars from that session, they're, they're very clearly playing two. every single time they're playing two different chords. That's There's wild. just sort of like a weird shimmer that happens because we got lucky, you know, <laughs> we got, we got fairly lucky and, uh, you know, and then like, we thought the song was so cool and I had to, I really had to live with the instrumental for quite a while, uh, before I, before as a vocalist, I felt where the moments were happening so that I could, so that I could vocalize around them and i had i had written this very long piece of verse that that you hear i think you hear about 50 percent of it in that song i had written this this it was kind of like a it was a it was it's almost like a love song i think it's it's it and one other song on this record are are basically love songs on record they don't exactly sound like it it because especially choir has kind of a menace to it but I was really fired up about something one night and I needed to blow off some steam and it was so late that I couldn't like go out and, you know, scream at the moon or whatever. So I went down into my basement studio. I turned on the mic and I was just like, I'm just going to see what happens. Just like record and let this thing run. And there's this, there, this piece of lyric was just hanging out on the other side of the room. So I just kind of picked it up and looked at it. And what you hear is what you get. Like that was, the first time I sat down and did it, and that voice was happening in real time. I didn't really, I didn't choose to control it or just, I just kind of let it happen. And then because I don't, because I never, I've never ever been interested in our recording sounding anything like reality. Uh, I, I, I'm more interested in like 
super reality or like hyper reality, like something that's so <laughs> fantastic, but sort of plays by the regular rules of music. So I went in on it, overdubbed uh, a second track where I just tried, I tried to remember exactly what I did on the first track. And I tried to just speak it again in time with it. And I just thought, well, wherever it falls off the, the grid, it'll, it'll kind of have this dizzying sort of effect. Uh, and then I'd heard that and I was like, okay, I'm going to keep some of that. And then I went in and whispered certain lines, like in either one or two octaves lower than the, than the performance so that it, it kind of sounded like a, like almost like a vocoder sort of deal or uh, some kind of har- some kind of harmonizer but i'm just whispering at the absolute bottom of my range wow uh, and i think so i think there's one moment in that where i'm saying a line in three different octaves which isn't particularly easy <laughs> you know? no it's not easy at all let me ask you a question to whatever extent you're comfortable there's this one lyric when they strip me to the bone there's nothing left to hide i had a I had a feeling, and I don't know, again, if you're comfortable, if that was a metaphor for something else. And I just oh, was... Yeah. The this, this song is filled with metaphors. I mean, it's, okay. it's about... It's, you know, the beginning of the song, sort of, it, it's sort of, as I said, it's, it's kind of a love song that deals with a more measured, balanced uh, type of love uh, that takes into account both its uh, rating brilliance and its sharp-toothed uh, underbelly, and um, I, yeah. So, so metaphorically, that line is sort of like about how wonderful it can feel to be broken down into your essence. Uh, but, but about how terrifying that is, like, because it feels like being stripped to the bone. It feels like being flayed uh, alive to expose your... To be that vulnerable act, with somebody. To, to show somebody who you actually are and to yeah. to give, you know, give that power over to them. And, and, you know, quite often that doesn't work well for the person uh, who's expressing themselves. Uh, yeah. And just, you know, I, I think a lot of times I'm trying to deal with my own duality, uh, which is, you know, at, at times quite dark and depressive and miserable and at, at times, you know, overjoyed and, and ecstatic and filled with, filled with exuberance. But they don't, but the, 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 the two things seem to walk the very same path. And I think sometimes that songwriting is a good place for me to unpack that reality and see what it, you know, see what it feels like when I, put it down on paper um, yeah so yeah it's but 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 like many of my songs there, there's there are several different levels that i write it out one of which is my my level one of which is how i think it's um you know i think in another way i was also we had just come up in 2019 we had finished this gigantic uh, European tour where we were playing it was just like stadiums every night almost you know stadiums and arenas every night and I felt stripped after it you know like huh. to, like my soul felt stripped from having that much physical attention placed on me and, and so sometimes I'm just writing about six different subjects at once um, and more importantly than any of that is that I would prefer, you know, I, I appreciate, I appreciate in my own life lyrics that have a little bit of mystery to them such that I can find myself in them and make my own assumptions or have my own experience with the song. I think that's something that we, tr- we do quite often. I don't even try to do it. It's just the way that, you know, the way that my lyrical stuff comes out is, Sometimes it's a, a bit obtuse and no one, no one really ever, you know, no one in the band ever really asks what or why. So I, I think it's, you know, I think we all appreciate a little bit of mystery and abstraction where we can find it in music or in this world where so much of it sure. is being spelled out to us so, so easily. And, um, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not interested in, well, I'm not, that's the wrong way to put it. 
I'm not a Johnny Cash or a Bruce Springsteen where I can inhabit somebody else and write a song that follows that sort of linear path. My brain just doesn't work like that. I, and sure. sometimes, I, sometimes I wish I had that type of designer brain that just takes the idea and sells it to you in the most efficient, most poignant, powerful, simplistic way. But it, that ain't me. So uh, my, I think my whole like creative output, it's, it's really about a million fragments of energy and a million tiny ideas that only make sense from 50,000 feet at all. And even then are sort of, you know, indecipherable. Like if you think about expressionist paintings, like, like a, like a Monet painting of a water garden or something, it's not, Hey, there's that flower, there's a bridge, there's some water. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a million strikes of paint, all of which are, represent a certain type of energy, all of which are hued or toned in a certain way where the picture is there if you need it. But that's really besides the point. The point is to, the point is that an atmosphere has been created and, and an energy has been sort of distilled uh, into, you know, onto a 2D surface in a way that gives us a little bit of mystification so that we have to, we, we walk into that environment and we go, okay, I like it here. It feels cool. Like that's to me, that's mute, mute, That's the superficial part of music. It's like, you got to grab people's attention, you know, drum fills, guitar solos, you know, big, bold, brash movements, but grabbing somebody's attention isn't enough. Again, it's like, it's like, it's the fireworks. Discussion. Right. Like, once you've got somebody's attention, you are obliged to give them something more uh, as if, if you consider yourself an artist, if you consider right, what you do right. like, a, like a work of art. And then, and it's, and it's not important that you know what exactly what you're asking. It's not important that you, there's a, even an answer. The important thing is that we as the musicians have questions still, and that the audience can have the experience of wondering and discovering and, and figuring things out if they have that energy, you know, again, come to the show, you know, dance your ass off. I, like, great, great. That's more immediately what, what we, you know, what, what works there, but, but substance is also critical. Character is really important. Uh, I, I can't do anything without um, at least asking myself why. Sure. I think it's I think it's the process of asking that that, that is critical because it, it puts you it puts you into a state of analysis and it makes it ensures that you're thinking critically even even as you're writing in, instinctively or intuitively. Like sometimes the most effective way to express something is by shouting and by being really, really high energy, direct brutal, savage, angry. Like those are, those are like blunt force tools that accomplish what blunt force tools do. They break through walls. They, they destroy things. They level, they level the ground, but you don't always need a sledgehammer. Sometimes you need a scalpel. So we try to choose amongst our tools at any given point in time to create compelling uh, bits of music that satisfy both the need to destroy and celebrate and dance and, and enjoy yourself, but also to reflect and also to question. And I think that's that's something that's particularly poignant and, and present in this in this this current and hopefully final lineup for Baroness is that where Gene and I, probably because we're guitar players and singers, we really tend towards sad and melancholic. Like we really tend towards the emotional sort of rawness of what we're of what the band is doing but nick and sebastian as a rhythm section don't concern themselves with that depth of the emotion and th those sort of those valleys of uh of thought and atmosphere they're concerned with keeping a pulse keeping a rhythm keeping the, the heartbeat alive and so they they understand that tone but a lot of times what makes our songs work i think particularly well is that i'll write about something that's very very difficult for me very very challenging subject matter and potentially sad you know potentially like sort of too over melancholic sorrowful or painful to like to really just use by itself 
but his whole vibe is like Van Halen, Krautrock, you know, like Kraftwerk meets fucking, you know, Motley Crue. It's just like his energy level is so different. That you're, talking about, you're talking about Nick? Well, no, I'm talking about Sebastian. It's such okay, a, right, right. It's so like over the top as a drummer sometimes. And and Nick, they as a rhythm section, they, they have to be synchronous that they're there to keep the energy level high so that I can deliver something that's, you know, otherwise kind of like maybe too morose or, oh God, what's the word for it? Um, but, but you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, it's, not yeah. like we're, it's not like we're intentionally juxtaposing high energy psyched with low energy sad. It's just that that works and it tempers both things so that, you know, his, you know, when he plays like some ridiculous drum fill that's, you know, it's like a snare roll for 30 seconds, and I'm singing about some painful life experience of mine, that both the, you know, the morbidity and, and bittersweetness of what I'm saying is tempered by his high energy, and his high sure. energy rock moves are then made more sophisticated by the uh, the relationship to, you know, what would otherwise be like probably too serious. Well, that's also pretty considerate of you said two things. Uh, two things came to mind when you're saying all this. It's pretty considerate of you that you're thinking, "Hey, let me." I want to be fair to the viewer, to the listener. But you also said, um, which was really impressive. Um, you said, "Now that I got your attention, I'm obli I'm obliged." I think is a word you said to yeah. make you feel something and do something. You know, I want to deliver. And that's like speaks to work ethic a lot as well, because people some not everybody's just you know a lot of people are lazy, you know, and they don't necessarily oh, have the some different. There are people, many people who are after a, an entirely different type of reward and entirely different type of right. success definition, you know, through through the entertainment industry. Correct. Uh, where and where the attention is like, oh, the attention feels good, the validation that you know. Everybody saying yes to you all the time feels good. Girls, you know, falling in love with you on stage is good. Right. Like, all of it, you know, making a making a decent paycheck and you know trying to make 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 while you can. That's fine. Like I, I sound a little judgmental, but I don't I don't mean to be. I'm just saying it's not it's not. It's just not what you're. Yeah, it's not for us. You know, like we sure we sure we we've been a professionally active band for for many years and we do have to make ends meet. But as anybody internal to our team will tell you, I sometimes seem like I'm actively against that type of success because I, I think for me, it, it's not, it's not necessarily that it's, it's that I just require some purity in what I'm doing. Yeah. Because some, some of what I'm doing is just like straight up entertainment, you know, it's yeah. straight up like look cool on stage, play loud, you know, swagger talk to people you know like that part of it i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say that that part of it's like horrible it's just it's definitely not enough for it's me it's not driving that, you yeah for me the record has been a success months before anybody else hears it because we've achieved it. like that. The, 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 the for, for me making the the act of creation is the important thing the process is everything to me so I like, you know, I, I need my, when I'm working uh, on music or when I'm working on art or lyrics or anything, there's a, there is a consistent, there, there's a, uh, there's like an integrity to the process that's very critical for me. And if I don't find that integrity, I have a very hard time working without phoning it in. And, you know, I'm not, not saying that I haven't, there's some, there's some, there's been some instances where just in the, in, you know, due to the nature of time constraints time. and kind of I mean, deadlines, like sometimes you got to sacrifice a little, but I won't release a record until it's done. And yeah. Done has nothing to do with it ever. So records the most important thing first and foremost, you know, with this band that, that there's a vision that we, we can at, at the very least say of every record we've released, this is, beyond 100 percent what we were cap what we thought we were capable of there is nothing else this is the gas has run out of the tanks we're running on fumes there's nothing else we can do if we add something else it dilutes the picture if we leave something out the picture is incomplete 
And that's and understanding where that point is as a musician is quite difficult. It's not I can define it very easily. I can look back in retrospect and say that it was done. But in real time, the fact is you're dealing with a group. There's four people. Some people think it's done early. Some people don't think it's done ever. You just have to find you have to find that spot where everybody can sort of mutually agree. We've 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 hit the threshold. If we go any further with this, we're just belaboring it, and it's gonna, it's going to sound like that. And uh, and and you know that ha- having said that, like that's because I like to I like layers. I like overdoing things. I like to think of the records as you know, or, or I like to think of the fundamental performance as always being there. And so, but by nature, by virtue of that fact, you can add as many guitars as you want. You can overdub drums. You can do double drums. You can play pots and pans. I don't give a shit. If it sounds cool, it makes the record. Right. And the more stuff that's on there, the more Easter eggs we hide in a record, the better. Because I think that, I think the the reward of an experience of listening to something like, like Dark Side of the Moon or um, and all, you know, or, or, or Wish You Were Here or something is because there's, there's hidden things. Oh, both there's of those. Lore, you know, there's lore behind those records. You know, it's it's why I love Radiohead so much because there's so many layers of details that you that that, that the fiftieth listen is also a rewarding thing. When it's fifty it's years that, later, even in a case like Dark Side no, of the Moon, yeah, totally. yeah. it still uh, it still sounds fresh. And yeah, like yeah, they didn't have Beat Detective, so it's not on the grid. Like, oh my god. Like, <laughs> Right, right. What would it sound like if somebody corrected all the put a, mistakes? Put a click on the track. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sounds, <laughs> I've, heard that, I've, heard, I've heard the music quantized before. It's fucking insane. That's but, nuts, man. But 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 you know, like you know, they spent more time getting the clocks right than they did just about anything else on the record, and that might seem like a waste of time to most musicians, but to me. Of course, you spend more time doing the two seconds of brilliance. That's yes, what, that's the nature of brilliance. Sometimes you can't script how it comes out. If it takes three days to, you know, synchronize all the clocks, so be it. So job be, yeah, well done. It lives, absolutely. It lives on for eternity. Yeah, taking three days and taking three days of studio time to get it. That's fine. I'm not sure it took three days, but. Um, but if it did, whatever, it would be totally make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it takes us months to accomplish is worth it if we accomplish that thing. I want to talk about one more uh, anodyne. The word anodyne uh, generally refers to some type of pain relief. Again, to whatever extent you're comfortable answering, I was curious if that song was written about some pain relief you had or some pain relief you wish you had. <laughs> Don't- you're asking me if I would give you a pain relief that I wish that I had, because unfortunately, due to the you know the accident in 2012, I was left with like very, very, very severe, very, very little. I don't, I don't ever get a break from the from the, the purely physical pain that I feel, and so you, you can imagine now wow. ten years on, no, I with, cannot with like a, a very like a nauseatingly intense amount of physical pain. It does have an effect on your mind you know it would be ludicrous to try to convince people otherwise so music has always been very therapeutic to me since since i've been injured the therapy the therapeutic cathartic nature of writing releasing and touring with music has become like quite an important part of me maintaining any level of stability and and confidence because uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm may- maybe like I'm misleading myself, but like I don't feel those. I don't feel that when we play. So on a very like basic level, m- music is a type of painkiller for me. Yeah. Uh, now, without getting too deep into it, I've been through all the rest of them as well. And um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't... And, I, and, I, and I still find that the most, you know, in my life, the most potent healthy constructive way of dealing with things has always been to the music because if i have thoughts that i can't i can't you know tangle with myself i write them down on paper and i sing them and then i'm sharing them with people and i'm de-emphasizing that sort of internal power that that that, that fears or anxieties or pains or stresses can have on you by by sharing it with people i mean that's a pretty common 
pretty common practice in therapy. Uh, but there's there's an elation and a, and a and a real. I guess I guess for me on stage, there's moments where I think I understand what religious people feel when they commune with God, and I think right. that the stage is a place where my God, which is creativity, is a, is very easy to commune with, and it's very easy to bear witness to, and it's very we easy to 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 feel the ecstasy from and to feel uh you know this the spirit of i i I, you know i think for a lot of people music is very similar to church yeah you know in in the way that that, that sports can be also the the same thing (laughs) sure it's a it's a communal there it's a communal thing uh, where we come together as a musical community or a spiritual community or a sports community, or whatever, you know, even, sure. and it's that, it's that communing with the thing that's greater than you or, you know, whether it's, you know, no matter what it is, you find comfort, you find relief in your, you know, uh, your audience mates, uh, or your church going mates or, or however you want to put it. And, um, there's, there is a very distinct power to that. And I think one of the things that, that really is impressive about music is that by and large, I think a vast majority of music is designed to be listened to by a crowd. You know, it works and operates best in a group. Uh, and I think historically, you know, that's the, you know, when we when we were at a much more in a much more primitive age, music was something that drew us together. Yes, uh, much more way than it is today. And so, you know, as somebody who's had sort of a you know rocky patch of like getting through life. Otherwise, the venue is also a place where I feel comfortable, where I can express myself without fear of repercussions or or being judged incorrectly or or just just straight up feeling like I'm at odds with you know, big box stores or something. I feel very sure. alien when I'm in those places. I've, I've had a very, you know, I have a very trying time socially outside of the music universe. So for me, it's kind of everything. And yeah, you know, a song like Anodyne, um, sorry, I'm just, I run off on tangents a lot. No, um, man, just, it's going through your head. Talk. But it, it's, I appreciate uh, it. You know, I, I think that there were, there were a couple of things that were really weighing me down at that, at that stage where I wrote that song. And, uh, you know, we, th- you know, Gina and I, I, we work, we work really hand in hand when we're doing vocals. We work, it's, it's, we work very intensely. And I think when we had the instrumental of that track, we, we assume, we assume the expectation would be that it was like a real kind of hard vocal style in that. I mean, if you just listen to the instrumental, it sounds like that's exactly what it sounds like it's going to be. But sometimes, just because defying expectations is fun and you know feels a little antagonistic which is where i feel right sometimes you know we decided to try to make the the, you know you know the vocal delivery in that song a little more atmospheric than it seemed to be asking for uh you know not just because it was it felt like sort of a funny bait and switch but also because some of the some of the other ideas we were using like just didn't they just didn't sound right so uh so we kind of found this dreamy almost almost dreamy sort of vocal delivery in that and you know the song is on the most superficial levels of just about this recurring sort of nightmare that i that i have and um you know and it's i think it's wrapped up in my like pain cycle or whatever so i always see that as something that can that you know in my mind my duty to the song is to sometimes be as raw and intimately exposed as i can possibly be to give as much of myself to the music as i possibly can without losing something of myself in the process um but that's not enough also what needs to what what needs to be present in music like that is it needs to speak to something more universal and everybody knows pain everybody knows the the idea of everybody has a reoccurring theme 
that haunts them at night. You know, everybody has had that. So I felt like that was, you know, this, what, what felt like it was going to be like a good snappy, quick three minute and 15 second, <laughs> uh, you know, fun rock and roll song turned into something a little more great track. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really cool. Like I didn't know if that song was going to work. It's, it was a, it was a tricky one, but, um, it's literally the only song we've ever recorded that has a four on the floor kick pattern and a backbeat. Ever. Interesting. So, Interesting. so I, I, that was like the fun challenge of it for me in the way that when we were, you know, when we made yellow and green, the challenge was writing songs with choruses. Like, we were, was writing songs that went verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, bridge, chorus, done. Uh, prior to that, we I had we called it just like A B C D E F G writing because <laughs> the parts don't the parts don't repeat themselves, and that was the cool thing about it. Um, you know, so f- for a song like Anodyne, the whole thing was like, okay, let's use the most basic rock drum beat that exists, and let's try to make that something we can do let's try to find something interesting there and i, I think we did with the time oh, it's, like... a gr- it's a great i mean it's a really it's an awesome song um you, you kind of mentioned some of them and if this question is redundant i was just curious what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them well the answer is all the answer to how to get through them has always been you know has has always had something to do with creativity it has always had something to do with painting or, or making music i mean these records are for me quite literally records of you know my life i i've been saying this through this like uh, interview cycle for this record but i really in the best case scenario at the end of the career of this band we look back at all of our records and there's a through line that's consistent through them in other words they're not different. They're not separate from one another. They're just separated by space and time. And each record is about that particular space and time that they're made in and the process being so important, it informs everything. So, uh, you know, I suffice it to say th- there was a handful of hard times uh, through the 20, early 2020s, I think for everybody, yeah. um, you know, for us, it was, it was like an existential thing that cropped up first and foremost, because we were at the time the lockdown happened, we were four days away from um, Australia, Japan, and then, you know, eight months of American touring and to have that and to have invested so heavily in that and to have had that pulled away from us was it, I don't need to get in the nitty gritty of it, but that left a dent that we continue to feel. We had really, I mean, we're, we're, we are very accustomed to touring year round. And so we put our time and our resources into that. And that was quite really not something that was happening. But then, you know, there's like some more like obvious kind of stuff. Like, you know, like for instance, I don't mean after, after August of 2012, like I'm I'm never going to feel the way I did before. It's never going to, there's never going to be a day in my life where I get to feel like that again. And it's, it's, something I sometimes struggle with, but sometimes in very rare moments, I, I'm able to work past it. It's only through writing these songs and dealing with some of those difficulties that have accrued over the past decade or some of the difficult realities of being stuck with yourself and all these feelings in a time when uh, uh, when, when you don't have any options. and. I think one thing that I learned that was really poignant uh, and I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but when we recorded all the instrumentals for this record in 2020, uh, Gene and I finished up nearly all the guitars for them in early 2021. And then I don't, I think for about 10 months, maybe even a year after that, not a single I vocal idea made it onto the record. Nothing. Because we were we had been off tour for a year. Uh, we started touring in fall 2021 and spring 2022. And it wasn't until we got out on the road and were playing music again that I had anything to write about. And I wrote wow. 
books and books and books of lyrics during those isolated years. And it just wasn't good. It wasn't, it didn't have a heartbeat. It didn't have a pulse. It didn't have, it didn't have a spark of life in it. And I, I realized very definitely that not in addition to just the pure act of creativity, I, I also have, I've also been traveling my entire life. I've never been still uh, for very long, more than a month or two at a time. Um, and I think that the, the effect that that had on me was like quite profound and immediately reversed by traveling again and touring again and coming into contact with people. So again, I say, I don't know if it's a positive thing. I don't know if it's a positive thing that I need to tour and I need to travel and I can't be in one city more than 24 hours comfortably. I don't, I don't know that that's a good thing, but um, that was something that was particularly difficult because it, it affected the it affected what was happening with with our record you know uh so you know there were there were there were things like that you know and then a lot, lot of personal things like there was it seemed like the through the years that we took to write this record uh quite a few of my friends passed away and you know, oh my god from you know sometimes from like quite horrible things you know cancers or, or addictions or sorry man and and and, and Again, I wouldn't write about it if I didn't think that was a universal thing. If I didn't think oh, that, was it, but, that everybody was experiencing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it good musical fodder. But it was, it was really tough to feel disconnected from the people that I loved and lost during that time period, and not, you know, maybe not getting a chance to say goodbye. And there was, you know, there's, there's a, there's a very real, lasting pain and sort of scar tissue that that, that, that comes with that that um, sometimes I just don't have a, I, I, I hope that like writing music is a fitting memorial to people uh, I, I hope it's not uh, in some way like a selfish way of using somebody else's experience to propagate your own you know oh, I don't I don't think anybody fun. looks at you feel so good when you listen to music I, I don't think yeah. I, I, it would be very contra everything to listen to something that makes you feel good and say wait a minute that guy yeah. is just exploiting i don't yeah i don't <laughs> no, but, but 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 like that's, i don't think it's a it's worry just, it's just a it's just a thing i'm like i try to be conscious and conscientious of um you know just trying to make sure that my uh my not making vision, your problems direct, other people's problems yeah that i'm not and i'm yeah. not trying to like cash in on I'm not trying to cash in on my story. You know, I think regarding the act and, you know, and the thing that we don't, we don't talk about, like I wrote a whole record about it, you know, right. like we did, I didn't need to write other records about that, but, but, but like real talk in reality, that, that is now part of my history. And so that's sure. always, there's always going to be shade. There's always going to be a shade of every fucked up thing and every amazing thing that's happened is, is going to somehow get channeled through my, you know, through my filter into the music, just like I, I assume it does with anybody, because we operate on that sort of emotional energy. Like it's, of course, it's good. yeah, it's, it's, good, it's good fuel. Like it's there's something more sustainable and lasting when you figure out a way to channel the past into something really powerful in the present, you know, and then to think that that that's something that you can then take and share with other people. No, it's you know, cathartic for you, cathartic for yeah. them. No, I think it's great. I mean, there's there's a reason when I'm like when I listen to music alone, I don't I don't, I don't jump to the like real high key, like high energy kind of stuff. That's like more fun to listen to with people. When I'm listening right. alone, I, I want to hear somebody. I want to I want to feel something, and and you know, it's it's artists who have like that direct connection to their their own darkness that i think really intrigue some of us but but also help others and when i when i see my when i see my experience reflected in a fresh light through somebody else's music that's an that the the you know the power of osmosis there is quite breathtaking because i can i can walk away from a song with a new perspective on life and that's yeah. that's and it's really really tremendous and 
also uncontrollable. Like you couldn't, I don't think the best songwriter could sit down and say, I want to write the best song I've ever written that speaks, you know, that really cuts through to the heart of everybody immediately. It's a very you interesting just, point you bring up. Yeah. You just sometimes sort of know that you've done it, but, but you know that you've done it. You don't know, you, you, you know, if, if there was a formula to it, look, everybody would do it, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why, that's why, you know, 90% of every pop song that came out last year had the same chord progression is because, well, there is a musicians, formula. Musicians and songwriters <laughs> are definitely looking for the one thing that does work in a semi-predictable way. And, you know, I, I find that era by era of music, it's like, it's the chord progressions yeah. you know, that, 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 that like people really key into. So what's that say to me? Okay. So it just says, just do your best not to like use those progressions. <laughs> right. Right. Else is, it'll, it'll make your music sound dated and, and, you know, when we when a when a band like us goes to record something we're recording it forever for everyone and forever it's it is the etern it is the eternity that we don't get to experience ourselves but we we are fortunate enough that we've found a means of expression that other people respond positively to and we've presented it in a format that if you know if this world exists on principle that music might may still exist i mean it's it's the reason why we're still why i'm still stealing beethoven melodies <laughs> that right music, on music like doesn't it doesn't fade you know and i want to i would like to think that i would like to think everybody's capable of creating something that can just stand as a memorial to them uh you know once they're gone so so i write music as i write music that i hope I'll be proud of by the time my life is nearing its end and that something that can endure beyond me and hopefully take something of substance into the future. Well, I, on a serious one, I really empathize with that you that you're in that much that you're in constant pain. Cause I had a couple of injuries over the last few years where I was in pain every day for like six to nine months. It's fucking exhausting. The I'm amount so, of energy totally. to manage pain. Yeah. I, it, it, I mean, I, I, you know, it's incredible. I, it's, it's, uh, tell me your top three desert Island discs in no particular order. And just that you're thinking of right now. Uh, wish you were here by Floyd. Love that record. It's so, yep. so, 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 so good. Um, uh, let's see Radiohead in rainbows. That's a really good one. And the record that got me the record that showed me I could be a musician. Nirvana's nevermind. I had that poster hanging in my son's wall on they, their room when they were they were little. It was really cute. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right, here's a tough one for you, man. What do you like most about yourself? Uh, well, I, what I love most about myself is what I also dislike most about myself, which is that I can't be stopped if I'm... If I'm if I'm onto something, I will not let reason, common sense, rationale, physical well being, mental well being, spiritual well being. I will not let those things get in the way of accomplishing something creative. I I believe that creativity is more important than anything. I believe it is what we as a species have been gifted that no, nothing else before us on this planet has had and i'll be damned if i'm gonna let any of it go to waste with me good for you man that's a good quality you have any non-musical superpowers uh i'm exceptionally good at parking vehicles and driving. <laughs> right. I, i'm really i'm really good at it. parallel parking you talking about i can parallel park a bus and trailer <laughs> that is pretty good man no, how did you develop that skill uh, i've been dr driving all the time since I was a kid. I'm just, I'm good at driving and I'm, you know, I drove, I drove our tour van for so many years Then the vehicle got bigger the trailers got longer and I just have a knack for it. And I don't know. I'm not extremely good at it. Most important lesson life has taught you. Never to give up. Easy answer, but kind of cliche. No, it's great. 
John, tell me the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and has that change been intentional or just a natural part of aging? Huh. I like to think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think I, I think that in my late 30s, I finally understood wisdom. I think I finally was given something of wisdom in my own life that I could apply that I had never been aware of before. Again, if you're comfortable, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like an overall perspective thing. Early in my life, I traveled a lot, you know, or like being in a band, you, you get a very good worldview, like pretty easily. I think it's actually quite important for anybody listening, if they haven't, to try with whatever means and wherewithal they have to see the world. I think it, I think it gives you a much better, more balanced understanding of yourself. Um, but I realized, you know, I realized that, I realized when to shut up. I realized when saying something wouldn't help. Uh, I realized, I realized how to apply wisdom. I guess, I guess I'll put it, put it that way. And I learned yeah. how to, I, it's, it's this is so, sort of difficult for me and I, maybe, maybe for a lot of musicians, but I understood that part, this is just an aspect of this that I'm talking about, but I understand that like part of what's actually important to us as musicians is to be somewhat selfish. We have to appreciate what we do enough such that we feel that there's something of value in what we do so that we might release it and so that we might give that, share that with people. Um, but understanding that aspect of the selfish nature of musicianship or musicianhood also comes with the implicit understanding that humility and trust and respect for everybody working around you is is the only reason that your selfishness gets to gets to flourish and gets to become a positive creative thing uh and so you know not not that i haven't always like had a great amount of respect for people working in parallel to me but I do think it's the most important thing for any musician to understand and to do is everything themselves as early as they can in their career. And I mean, booking tours, setting up your stage, learning how to record, learning how to write, learning how to sing, taking all of your instruments seriously, uh, learning how to do everything that somebody, if, if you were to succeed in a significant way, Learn how to do every job that anybody you'll ever hire will have to do so that you know who to hire, why you're hiring them, and what, and you can explain to them what you need. Uh, because ultimately, if you stay in this game long enough, you are not working as hard as your crew. You are not working as hard as your team. Uh, they are, they, you know, pe people, in this, people in this industry, and I, I, I assume there's a corollary with just about every other professional industry, but the... We, we are humans, we're social creatures, we work better as a team. In order to work as a team, there needs to be a mutual understanding, love, respect for one another. And part of that comes with ditching the false humility uh, and coming up, you know, defining a, a type of confidence and swagger that is genuine to you. So, and a type of work ethic and, and self-reliance so that when you do something well, you can take a genuine pride in what you do that that remains free from hubris and that when you fuck up all you're doing is learning what not to do next time take every take every failure as a lesson take every success as as a win in the correct way right on man thank you uh, i want to tell people what you got going on now, but I just want to say thank you so much for everything, man. You really appreciate all your sincerity and I yeah. can see why your music is so the way it is because yeah. getting married a little bit is, yeah, is, I'm done. I'm like this all the time. It's like,
I can no, continue. that's great. I mean, but you know what, man? I love that. You know, I'm the kind of guy, don't piss on my back and tell me it's fucking raining out. You yeah. know, I want to just be be genuine. And, and you certainly are. And I, and I appreciate that very much because it's not yeah. a character that characteristic that everybody's uh, bold enough to to share. So thank you for everything, man. I really appreciate it. Don't ever it. ask me for like a recommendation with comedy or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> So listen, yeah, you're getting ready to do. Okay, first of all, I would love everybody to check out Baroness and uh, the new record is called Stone. Uh, website is your Baroness B A R O N E S S dot com. The band's getting ready to do a pretty lengthy USA tour now, right? Yes. Okay. You'll probably see us in Europe in early 2024. Awesome, and you know we didn't have enough time, but I want to. John is. I mean, he's an incredible artist, man. So if you want to check out and uh, buy some of his stuff, or just to go look at it, it's beautiful. You can go to a perfect monster dot com, which is a funny uh, name. Now that I know, I got to know you a little bit. I kind of understand why you call it. That. It's a Christine per- Erickson lyric. Oh, is it? Okay, interesting. Well, um, night- what is it called? Night. The so- there's a song. He's- there's a Rocky Erickson song called "Cold Night for Alligators" that has that line. Okay. <laughs> interesting uh it's a perfect monster.com what else can i promote here what do you want where you got you know follow them on youtube or on socials and i'm you know sure. like so, <laughs> this, look is, up Nashville, you find <laughs> this is where i have a total fucking lapse because i'm 59 and i'm like uh go to their socials and click the button like follow them like them whatever but really yes. check out baroness <laughs> yeah hit the subscribe button and and thumbs up <laughs> Uh, but no, check out, this is a great band. Their music is phenomenal. If you're into like hard rock and roll and just genuine, great stuff going on, um, a phenomenal band. I could tell you that any kind of music that you listen to, you're going to find it, a, something in Baroness that you're going to love and enjoy. So I really appreciate you checking out any, uh, final words of wisdom, man. No, man. I think I still, I think I'm still it off. <laughs> Enough of every time. I know. I know what I sound. I sound is like this. The way that I talk is sometimes annoying. It sound, I sound. No, just, you know, sound, to... dude. You sound honest. <laughs> it's called honesty, man. That's it. You, you can't be honest in sixty seconds, man. You got. You got to share the story. Yeah. Right. Exactly. There's always a reason why something happened, and you're gonna share it, and that's fucking great, as far as I'm concerned. You know. Uh, yeah. Hang on one second, and through uh, through October, November, and into a little bit of December, we should be hitting. Just about everywhere in the in uh, North America, uh, we'll be in Canada for a little bit, in the U.S., all over the U.S. And if you don't see us in your town on that tour, you better believe we'll be coming back around in 2024 to do any city we missed. Uh, for, awesome. For- Awesome. Very cool. Hey, hang on one second and we'll wrap up. I want to tell everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it on your social media channels and uh, spread the word. Uh, We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to John Basie for spending time with us. And remember that most important, happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. John, thanks for everything, brother. Of course.